It's a tale full of ifs, mays, and coulds. Things might have been this way, but then again, they might not. You have to be careful with stories like this, because they could lead you into trouble. But if they don't, they may turn out to be entertaining, if not informative. In August 2019, the Bamberg Diocesan Museum in southern Germany announced they had found the gravestone of Sophia Maria von Ertal. Or Maria Sophia. Sources differ, but since you can read it right off the gravestone, we'll go with the name actually on the press release. It was lost for years when the church in whose yard it stood was demolished in the 19th century. Sophia died, by the way, in 1796. And at that time and in that place, it was very unusual for a woman to be buried with her own gravestone. So, for that alone, Sophia is noteworthy. Of course, it may have helped that she was the daughter of the local prince, Philip von Ertal, and the baroness von Bettendorf. Born in 1729, Sophia Maria also had two, no doubt equally helpful, brothers, Franz Ludwig von Ertal and Friedrich Karl Joseph von Ertal. You'll remember Franz, more properly Prince Bishop Franz Ludwig, from such popular hits as generally being in favor of the Enlightenment and promoting it with the first modern hospital in Bamberg and the introduction of public social insurance. You may recall her other brother better as an archbishop who was appointed in 1774 to his position specifically to reduce the influence of the Enlightenment on schools and ministries. We can only imagine what family dinners were like at home until Archbishop Friedrich decided maybe the Enlightenment was okay after all in 1777 and restored everything he'd tried to undo. In any case, Sophia Maria was no random citizen. Her mother, the Baroness von Bettendorf, died when Sophia was about 18. Her father had a big factory to run, and being a prince, he found it prudent to remarry in fairly short order. Enter Claudia Elizabeth Maria von Wenningen, Countess of Reichenstein, a stepmother. She, it is said, was not kindly disposed to any of her newly acquired stepchildren, most especially not Sophia, which of course led to a fair amount of additional strife at home. Now, there are two other things to know about this otherwise so far mostly unremarkable story. The first is that it occurred in a place called Lor am Main in Bavaria. It was then and is now a relatively small town situated on the banks of the river Main along the eastern slope of a range of low wooded mountains called the Spessart. What makes this important to our story is that in seven of those mountains were seven mines that were worked either, depending on whom you choose to believe, by people of very short stature or children, thanks to the very low ceilings and chambers within. Some even say the workers wore hooded cloaks to keep the damp of the forest off as they went to and from the mines. And if you're starting to see the shape of the story here, well done. You're performing the same trick as the museum did with the press release, looking for bits of information that make the story fit a whole of a certain size and shape, a story we all know pretty well. But you're still missing one piece. So let's bring everyone to the end together. The second thing you need to know is this. Remember when we said back there that Sophia's father, Prince Philip, had a big factory to tend to? For centuries, the electorate of Mainz has been known and well regarded for its glassworks. And the prince was in charge of it. When he married Sophia's stepmother, so the story goes, he commissioned for her a special mirror as a present. It was of such a surpassingly fine quality, with a clarity and smooth, even surface never before seen, that it became known as a mirror that spoke the truth. In other words, it showed you just as you were, with no distortion. Not only that, it was said to bear an inscription. Two, really, and very odd they were for a wedding gift. One side of the mirror has the words for reward and for punishment, beneath depictions of a crown, palm leaf, and olive branch. The other side shows a sun and a sunflower above words that mean both true love and pride. And for that reason, it's referred to as a talking mirror. And as they used to say, now you know the rest of the story. In Loram, Maine, Maria Sophia Margarita Katerina Freefraulein von Ertal is the canonical Snow White. All the main elements are there, the mirror, the stepmother, the mines, the dwarves who work them, even the dark and foreboding woods. And they've even got her gravestone at the local museum, proving once and for all that she was a real person and the story really happened and it really happened there in Lore Am Main. As for the fairy tale, 60 years after she died, the brothers Grimm, who were born just down the road in Hanau, 
probably heard the story and dressed it up for their little book. And if that isn't enough for you, if you still don't believe it really was her that inspired Snow White, just go to the old family castle, which is now a museum itself. You'll see it, because right there, on a wall, is the stepmother's actual mirror. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. How often have you just stood and gazed into a mirror in the morning, wondering why in the world you even bothered to get up at all? For you, that mirror is likely to be a sheet of float glass coated on one side with a very thin silver and copper mixture with a few layers of waterproof paint over it. It's referred to as a silver glass mirror for obvious reasons. Float glass is made by pouring molten glass over a surface of molten metal, usually tin. It produces a sheet of glass that is both uniform in thickness and very, very smooth on one side. The glass floats on top of the tin until both have cooled, giving it its name. These kinds of mirrors are easy to mass produce, durable, clear, and used almost everywhere for household mirrors of every description. Other specialty mirror glasses exist, of course, but the basic principle is the same. Take some smooth glass and coat the back of it with something. Aluminum glass mirrors get a vacuum coating of aluminum powder covered in paint. Safety glass mirrors have a thin film on the back to prevent jagged shattering of the glass should it break. And silk screen mirrors use a special ink to make colors and patterns that show through the glass for decorative purposes. That's the easy part out of the way. Glass mirrors generally fall into one of those several categories and all work in more or less the same way. Light enters the front of the mirror and reflects or bounces off the coating at the back of the glass and out through the front again. The physical characteristics of the light are largely preserved and returned to the viewer as they originally went in. This sort of reflection is called specular reflection. You get out what you put in. Each ray of light that strikes the mirror and is reflected obeys the law of reflection which states that for each ray striking the mirror, the angle at which it strikes the reflective surface must equal the angle at which it is reflected. The opposite is called diffuse reflection. Light strikes an object and is reflected back in any old which way, causing it to spread out and diffuse as it does so. Rather than a coherent image being reflected, the light goes everywhere and anywhere it wants to. If you've ever seen those big white fabric panels being held up around the head of an actor being filmed or a model being photographed, those are diffusion reflectors designed to soften harsh light and bounce it in a way that doesn't cause harsh shadows and so produces a more even illumination. Of course, no mirror is perfect. For any of a variety of reasons, some light loss occurs as the rays of light bounce around inside the mirror. But glass, for ordinary purposes, is more than sufficient to help you get your makeup on or shave off the overnight stubble. However, the early shavers and makeupers of the olden days, the technical term for any period earlier than last week according to the internet, had it a lot rougher. It's one of the reasons so many extra people seem to be present in the boudoirs of ladies and bedrooms of men in all the period pieces. Half of them were there to check you out and make sure you didn't look a fool with your half-shaved face and your lipstick all up by your ear. Because mirrors prior to the glass ones were pretty terrible in terms of actually being able to view yourself. In the very early days, there were really only two ways to see yourself. You could gaze into a dark pool of water and see your wobbly reflection on the surface. Not the best thing to shave with and why so many cavemen were discovered with only one eyebrow and a full beard. Or you found yourself a shiny stone you could peer into, say a thick bit of obsidian, and tried to peek around all the lumpy creased bits while carefully applying lipstick to each nostril. Not, in either case, an ideal solution. The thing is, you need two very specific things for an actually good mirror. The surface has to be very, very flat. No lumps, bumps, pits, dimples, crinkles, creases, or cracks. Just as flat and level as you can get it. Anything else produces a distorted image that isn't true to the original, the thing being reflected. The other thing you need, and for a long time this was harder than getting things flat, was a surface with a roughness smaller than the wavelength of light. It needed to be that smooth so that light couldn't fall into imperfections bigger than that, otherwise it wouldn't reflect properly. And what is that wavelength, you may well ask? For visible light, that's between 400 and 700 nanometers. That's a decimal point followed by seven zeros, followed by a number from four to seven. For those playing along at home, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter, or for the Americans in the audience, one two billion one hundred sixty millionth of a Shaquille O'Neal. Handy. 
What was less handy was trying to polish a stone enough to get it to properly reflect even a little. Stones are, by their nature, rather hard. At least, any stone worth polishing was. It took a lot of time and a lot of effort to get one shiny enough that you could see some portion of yourself in it, and more than one person was disappointed with the results of that much effort. So you can imagine how happy everyone was when they discovered that some metals could be polished much more easily, and you could see your own reflection that way. Of course, the difficulty then became trying to make mirrors light enough to be useful, but not so light they warp. And since softer metals tended to work better and were easier to polish to reflectivity, this was a real challenge. Early offerings from Egypt, Greece, Rome, and others were frequently made by mixing tin and copper in various ratios to get bronze, pewter, and similar metals, all of which could be cast flat and take a polish. The best results, of course, came from precious metals. Once people worked out how to silver and gild cheaper metals, it was reasonably easy to produce mirrors that worked well enough, if not perfectly. Three main problems remained, though. The quality of the reflection, while acceptable, wasn't great. Lots of light was being randomly scattered even at high polishes, and so images tended to look a bit fuzzy. You were at the mercy of the color and quality of the metal being used to reflect. Gold tended to make things look, unsurprisingly, golden color. Brass and copper similarly added unwanted color to the image. Some metals and alloys would gradually change color over time with exposure, usage, and the effects of smoke, soot, and other pollutants settling on them. Third, many metals would tarnish or rust over time as they reacted with their environment, requiring their mirror to be constantly cleaned and maintained. Any amount of exposure to moisture could prematurely ruin a mirror, and they were not inexpensive to replace. In all, it was a pretty big hassle just keeping mirrors in working order. There were a couple of important distinctions between mirrors then and mirrors now, besides just the materials in use. As Sabine Melchior Bonet points out in her book The Mirror, A History, Nearly always rounded, these mirrors were either concave or convex. Ancient mirrors were generally very small, roughly 5 to 8 inches in diameter, and were used primarily in three ways, as pocket mirrors enclosed in cases, as grooming mirrors equipped with a welded handle and a ring so that they could be held before a master's face by his slave while he went about his daily grooming and then hung on a wall, and finally, as stationary mirrors propped on a three-legged stand. The convex and concave shapes distorted images reflected in them so that you had to be very specific about where you aimed the mirror and where you looked into it in order to see things as they were, but full-length metal mirrors were often worse. Their own weight could cause them to sag, and even the naturally occurring distortion made them unflattering at best at those sizes. Besides, how could you show off how wealthy you were if you had to drag people home all the time to see the size of your weirdly distorted mirror? Instead, you could just whip a smaller one out of your pocket at a party. Famous Roman, Seneca, was unhappy with Roman women and their love of ostentatious little mirrors. He wrote, For a single one of these mirrors of chiseled silver or gold inlaid with gems, women are capable of spending an amount equal to the dowry the state once offered to poor general's daughters. Eventually, as people worked things out and refined their technique, mirrors got bigger and more fancy. Some even came with their own utensils, including sponges and brushes, because metal mirrors needed to be polished before every use. Gradually, metallic mirrors, especially silver ones, became more accessible, and the lower classes could begin getting their hands on them with relative ease. So the upper class used mirrors made of precious stones. Our buddy Pliny notes that Nero himself had mirrors made of black carbuncle and emerald, and even covered the walls of his house with fengite, a kind of highly reflective mica. Glass mirrors eventually came along, though at first they weren't much better than the old metal ones. Warps and bubbles and odd chemistry often meant glass mirrors showed distorted images that rippled across their surface in uncanny ways, and because so much of the glass of the time contained iron impurities, were dark and green in nature. Which may well be the origin of the phrase, through a glass darkly, as used in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12 in the Bible. Images in these mirrors were dark, often indistinct, and hard to see. Sometimes it was impossible to understand just what it was you were seeing. In any case, it's a short step from there to feeling a bit weird about mirrors and what they show. After all, it looks like you, but it isn't really you. And thanks to reflection and the way it works, the image seems flipped, even though it isn't. The rumor is the Romans thought the mirror reflected not you, but your soul, and that your soul was replenished every seven years thus giving rise to the superstition about breaking mirrors. Some Greeks thought that mirrors could, in a limited way, be used for divination. The practice was called catoptromancy. 
If you were sick and prayed to the goddess and burned incense, you could lower a mirror on a thread into the fountain outside the temple of Ceres in Patras until it just touched the surface of the water and look into it. If the face you saw was happy and healthy, you would recover. If it looked like death warmed over, best to settle your funeral expenses ahead of time. We just have to wonder if that said more about your ability to afford good mirrors and therefore good care than it did about your state of health. Anyway, once you've got mirrors predicting your future, it isn't long before they are magic in some way. Like Snow White's. Or like Yara no Kagami, the sacred mirror of Amaterasu and part of the official imperial regalia of Japan. Amaterasu, for those of you who've never run across the video game Okami, or maybe especially for those of you who have played Okami, is a major player in the Shinto religion, the goddess of the sun and the universe. As such, she was responsible for maintaining balance and harmony in the realms of Earth. She did so with the mirror Yara no Kagami, the jewel Yasakani Magatama, and the sword Kusanagi no Tsurugi, all of which are, so the story goes, kept at the Aisei Grand Shrine in Japan under lock and presumably key for none to see. The mirror itself represents wisdom or honesty because according to the ancient Japanese, mirrors only ever represented truth, reflecting only what was shown. The mirror was very rare in ancient Japan and so held in much reverence. Entire stories in Japanese folklore are about what life was like before the mirror came to be. When it comes to mirrors magical though, there seem to be four basic types. First, you have the mirror that lets you see whatever you ask for. Basically, you look in the mirror, tell it what you want to see, and it shows it to you. Ask to see the current location of the missing MacGuffin, and it will show it to you perched on its little purple pillow in the villain's lair. Other pillows are available. Curiously, no one seems to ask the mirror to show anything actually useful, like say a map to the location of the MacGuffin and a complete schedule of the guards patrols. Or even better, the name and address of someone actually foolish enough to try getting it themselves. No, instead they go around looking at dead parents for days on end when they really should be studying for class or at least really desiring the answers for the next test. Other mirrors aren't really mirrors. They're basically doorways. Sometimes this is influenced by the first type of mirror, but mostly it just happens more or less spontaneously that these sorts of mirrors are looking at somewhere automatically more full of adventure and excitement than wherever you are right now. Which is odd when you think about it. Surely some of the mirrors in cool places should take you to dull places. But nope, never seems to happen. Oh, also, the places you go to generally seem to be a bit more medievalish, with horses and knights and monsters of one sort or another. Unless it's one of the ones that goes to a place exactly like your own, except now you can't use right-handed shears either. Ha! Also, make sure you write down any poetry you might hear. The third type of mirror is a mirror in form and function reflecting whatever is standing in front of it, right up until you say the magic word three times, at which point they become a summoning focus calling into existence whatever creepy, mean McBadenstein is on the other side. Bloody Marys, Candymans, and beings not of this earth being the most popular. Just looking in a mirror can be bad enough, but repeating anything three times out loud is probably best avoided even without a mirror. No one has ever seen a completely sane person do it. The final type is, of course, the kind of mirror you ask questions to and get answers from. In a rhyme, if you please. Reportedly, the answer is always true, but it may not be worth the hassle if you need an answer about something that doesn't rhyme with wall. After all, where would you put it if you needed information about a wolf? There seem to be two main sources for all the mirrors you meet in various films, books, and video games, though they may vary in specific effect. In general, they all fall into one of those four major categories above, and those categories seem to come mostly from either Snow White or Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There by Lewis Carroll. There are a few, like Amaterasu's mirror, that fall outside that scope, but they're the exception rather than the rule. So compelling is the idea of the mirror in Snow White that even Amazon tripped over it and thought, hey, wouldn't it be a good idea if, and came out with their Echo Look device in 2017. Built on the idea of a smart speaker like the rest of the Amazon Echo product line, the look came with a built-in camera that could take head-to-toe photos and six-second videos of you and your outfit. You could then compare one outfit with another as you actually wore them and perform something called a style check to see if you actually had any while posing in front of a camera connected to the internet. We're guessing not. Finally, after the look had sorted your clothes and suggested things to go with your already existing wardrobe, nope, not kidding. You could ask Alexa how you looked for specific advice on why you should never leave the house under any circumstances. 
Because what you really want is fashion advice from an algorithm connected to a company that has a vested interest in selling you things, a general problem with information security, and now free access to pictures of you in various stages of dress. Mirror, mirror, in obscurity, can we have better security? You've been listening to GM Word of the Week. Thanks for joining us on our little journey through the land of mirrors. We hope you and yours are still healthy and in good spirits. As spring springs, remember it's okay to open the doors and windows and let some of that fresh air in. Unless, of course, someone is standing right outside your window waiting, in which case you've got bigger problems than self-isolation. We're coming up on the, gosh, let me see, five year, is it really five years? I guess it is, and I should know, the five year anniversary of the show. Thanks so much to all our listeners and patrons for making that possible. Five years. Good grief. Doesn't feel like it. But there you go. If you'd like to help support the show and say thanks, you can head to gmordoftheweek.com and click on the yellow banner at the top to find ways to do that. Hello, Australia. I told you I was going to be better at checking foreign locales for reviews. And what did I spy when I checked on Australia? Not one, but two recent reviews of the show from Laura Ash Miller and ACOP Woody. We'll happily take our curmudgeon badge and thank you both for the very kind words. I might stumble across your review one day if you care to leave one where I can find it, and it helps other people find the show and enjoy it too. So why not? This episode was researched, written, and produced by me, Brian Casey, a man of deep reflection. The music for this episode comes to us from Blue Dot Sessions, which you can find at sessions.blue. What do you mean, Fib? asked Mrs. Squeers, looking in her own little glass, where, like most of us, she saw not herself, but the reflection of some pleasant image in her own brain. 